Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Auto Trading Live Strategy Session with Jeff Tompkins. This is your host, Richard Van Rich, and we have with us Craig Ward in the chat, as always. So, so glad to have you guys with us here this evening. Got a lot of great information to go over. Got the continuation from last week's session here. So it's going to be a great night. I'm really glad to have you guys on. This is your first time on one of our sessions. You notice that your microphones are all muted. That's so we can hear Jeff and I talk. But if you toggle your screen, you'll find a Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen or a chat box. Put questions in there and we'll get to those throughout the evening and also before we sign off. If you have any questions about your account, trade alerts that are open, access to Zillion, Trade Trend, any of the other products or service or anything customer service related, email support at altoistrading.com and we'll get to those questions uh, sometime tomorrow. If you have to hop off for any reason, don't worry, this is recorded. It will be available in the members area later tonight and also uh, sometime tomorrow on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe so you can catch all of our videos as we're doing these every Tuesday night. So before I bring on Jeff, let me just read the disclaimer. Altos Trading LLC and Trade Transilient software is intended to be used as an information service for subscribers, and it includes opinions as to buying, selling, and holding various stocks and other securities. However, publishers of Altos Trading Trade Transilient software are not brokers or an investment advisor, do not provide investment advice or recommendations directed to any particular subscriber or in view of the particular circumstances of any particular person. Auto Trading LLC, including its owners, do not accept responsibility for any decisions made by subscribers using the software and subscribers to the Trade Transilient software. Any of the persons who buy, sell, or hold security should do so with caution and consult with a broker or investment advisor before doing so. All right. With that being said, let me bring on Jeff. Jeff, you there? Yeah, well done. You have that memorized yet? I'm telling you, man. It's like I wake up in the middle of the night doing it. Why, like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why is Richard reciting the, uh, the disclaimer uh, in his sleep? That, uh, it's like a beautiful mind. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, good. Yeah, doing pretty well. Uh, are you guys going out of town for the holiday? No, we're we're actually staying here, hosting Easter at our house on Sunday. Awesome, man. And what about you guys? Uh, yeah, we're we'll probably doing a little bit. Go to my uh, mother in law's house. I don't some Easter egg. My daughter's still small for she likes to do that. So we'll be boiling boiling eggs Friday and. Painting eggs and hiding and all that fun stuff. Yeah, only like Easter egg hunts that have uh, money in them. Easter eggs. I know. That's the thing. My wife's like, she wants me to go up and buy all these little things to put inside the eggs. I'm like, ah, just put quarters in there. That's all they want. <laughs> Hundred quarters and candy. <laughs> <laughs> Out of my house. That's funny. Well, yeah, guys. So the welcome everybody. Uh, the markets are closed Friday. Good Friday. Closed for. Good Friday holiday. So just FYI, we just have two trading days left in the week. And we'll map out our key levels to start our session tonight and some important ones to watch, keep an eye on. Um, we'll follow up with the levels we looked at last week, too, because uh, we talked about how if that resistance level broke and the VIX continued to rotate lower below the 20 level, expect to run up in the markets. And we got that. So if you guys, uh, hopefully you're, you're paying close attention to our uh, market overviews, which we start every week out with because uh, they have proven uh, very valuable in terms of knowing what, where the levels are and what to expect if we move through one of those levels or off one of those levels in reverse. So pay close attention, get your, pe your pen and notepad out. Uh, of course, we do record these. I post these in uh, the members area if you're a current member or uh, our YouTube channel. Um, we'll take a look at the 36 month moving average. We started out a new month. We're in April now. And when we met last week, we were wrapping up March. And so uh, we'll take a look at where things ended up on a monthly basis in uh, the broader indices. Uh, we're going to follow up because last week we started talking about how to get the options market to pay for your trades. Uh, which was a bit more of, of an in-depth topic and, and strategy. Um, so we're going to carry that over from last week and uh, finish up uh, talking about that strategy this week. So uh, we'll continue with how to get the options market to pay for your trades. We'll uh, show some examples, look at some risk graphs, and um, and then we'll open it up for ticker roundtable. And we can actually, uh, if you guys are interested in any tickers that you want to look at, and how we might structure that type of uh, option strategy, uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, we'll also take a look, 
little bit of a look uh, regarding using this uh, outside of purely options. As I mentioned last week, um, we can use we can sell premium to purchase shares of uh, of equities and ETFs as well. Uh, so there's it's a very versatile approach we can use across markets. <clears throat> um, and then we'll wrap up with our Q and A. Uh, so let's get over to our charts and see if we've got uh, our current day's data loaded up here. Let me go over to our index products, S&P 500, and we've got it there on the chart. Um, so we had a bit of a rotation lower uh, today. Let's let's talk about that uh, because it was at, uh, right near a resistance level. Um, but basically the catalyst uh, was was the job market. So we had kind of snapped this nice four day uh, run up we had with four consecutive days of uh, higher closes. And let me get my drawing tool he out here. Um, <clears throat> right, so we had, we, we've had we had a nice uptrend since earlier in March. Um, so the month of March looked really nice. Um, and then, of course, the previous four trading days have looked really good on a closing basis. Um, and then today we got uh, a bit of a reversal pattern. Um, and again, catalyst being uh, the job market. So um, the, the the stock market kind of saw it as a cooling pattern, the job market, you know, cooling off. Um, and that was mainly behind data that showed that uh, job openings were below uh, 10 million uh, in the month of February. Um, and that's the first time they dropped below 10 million uh, over the past uh, two years. So that kind of rattled the market uh, a bit here and, and was the catalyst behind the, uh, the, the reversal day that we had today. Reversal being that we actually opened a higher than Monday's close and then closed lower. Okay. And so <clears throat> looking at the levels, this happened right near a resistance level which is just right around 4,100 century mark, right? So um, if we look at today's close on the S&P, uh, we were at 4,160 cents. So we're right there at that century mark. <clears throat> so while this was previously a resistance level due to the fact that, right, we've seen prior resistance at the century mark and rotations lower, um, it still is a technical uh, support level uh, because we did close above 4,100 just by a bit. So this is going to be a critical level 4,100 to watch for tomorrow. Okay, so if we see the VIX remain low, and we'll take a look at the VIX here in a second, then we expect... And I'll talk about the, the levels to watch in the VIX, but we expect, we see S&P hold this 4,100 support. We expect a, a continuation of the run-up. Might not happen tomorrow, but we want to watch how price reacts around this 4,100 century mark. Um, if we can remain above and we, we resume the uh, rotation higher, uh, we really want to keep a close eye on 4,200 as a next century mark and also a major level of uh, resistance, where we can see back in late January, early February, we had a very significant reversal lower uh, from this 4,200 century mark. <clears throat> All right, so um, we've talked about some of these lower levels of support, like around 3,800 to 3,900, um, those holding VIX rotating lower due to the inverse relationship between VIX and S&P, and those have played out nicely. We looked uh, last week at like the, I think we were right around the 4,000 millennial mark last week. And we were looking that, at that as a uh, resistance. Um, and so since we've met, you know, as I mentioned last Tuesday on our session, if we break through and close above 4,000, which we did last week after uh, we met right here, um, 
then expect a rotation higher into the 4100 level, which was our next area of resistance. And we actually got that and broke it. Okay, so um, this was accomplished by looking at these levels in combination with what the VIX is doing. <clears throat> so those are the, the key levels. Uh, so we've got currently got price pretty much right at support. Um, we've got resistance up here at 4200 if support holds and we can continue to rotate higher. If we break this support level, it will then become resistance. So for that for that to occur, we need to see an actual close uh, below four, uh, 4100. And ideally, we'd like to see two to three days of closes below. And in which case, if that occurs, uh, we're looking for a move back into so, uh, the lower area of support at 4,000. But this is overall on a more of a medium term basis, uh, bullish for the markets. We were able to break this 4,000 level on the S&P. Um, and then if we look at the monthly chart of the S&P, <clears throat> let me uh, switch this over to a monthly chart. It's going on 15 years, go to a month. And let's throw up our 36 period moving average on the monthly chart. All right, and we're on the Q, so let's switch over to the SPX. All right, and so take a look here. We once again, have pushed higher off the 36 month moving average. So this 36, this is a monthly chart again, we're looking at here, but this 36 period moving average has uh, continued to serve as very strong dynamic support. So if we look at the level of the, the current level of the 36 period moving average, it's just a tad below 4,000. So it's coming up right into that 4,000 millennial mark. So 4,000 that's just strengthening its confluence between static and dynamic support, st strengthening this 4,000 support level. Okay, so if we can see that hold, um, again, that's more medium to long-term bullish um, for the markets. On a more medium to longer-term basis, we really need to see S&P push through that next level of resistance that we just looked at on the daily chart at 4,200. If we can get a close on a monthly basis, so uh, again, this is more medium to long term because um, these are monthly candles. So we need to see an actual close at the end of a month above forty two hundred. It's within, you know, the it's within range for April if we can push, uh, continue to push up in April. Uh, but if we can get a close, because we haven't had one um, since the bear market set in, right? So if you look at all of these monthly candles. Not a one has, have we closed above 4,200 on the S&P? And we traded above, but they've all been false breakouts of 4,200. And you can see when the bear market was setting in, we had support there. So that support, of course, transitioned to resistance once we sold off below the level. So 4,200 is critical key and if we can get a monthly close above, then I've got the conviction that this dynamic support at the 36 period moving average is going to hold more medium to long term. So that's what I'm watching for. Uh, and then now if we go back over to the Qs, the NASDAQ 100 ETF, take a look what's going on here. We see that we've broken through resistance right around 315, 3, 315 to 316. <clears throat> um, so again, we had we actually had a gap lower on the open in the queues today in a rotation higher. So interestingly, it wasn't quite as spooked by the the job data. The reduced number of job openings that February's report put out. Okay, so um, this is a this is a key level of support now at this point, and 
for any long opportunities, any buying opportunities, um, and we did actually have a buy signal that hasn't triggered yet from Trade Trend yesterday. Um, I'm looking for either that this buy signal to trigger because it's off support. Not my favorite because uh, I, when I see buy signals at the top of a move, we had a big run up here. They don't tend to run as far before retracing as a buy signal at a bottom of move like this one down here, which had a lot of room to run. Um, but nevertheless, this this signal <clears throat> here from yesterday, I'm looking for that to follow through, hit the entry and resume higher or a potential retest of this support level around 315 and a resumption of the of the move higher okay so pretty basic stuff on the queues um we don't have a lot of near-term overhead <coughs> excuse me resistance grab a drink of water here okay so our next high pivot point is up around 335 from back in august of last year um so that's a you know ways off 15 points off from current price levels uh, and again, if, if these key levels of support can, can hold, that would be really the next resistance, uh, level right around 335 that I'd be watching for where, you know, if we make it up there, then, um, there's a, a higher potential for a stall and reversal. <clears throat> and then if we look at the VIX, <clears throat> Okay, so we're continuing to get relatively low readings on the VIX. So we the key level we watch here again is 20. <clears throat> so particularly when we're spending days or weeks below the 20 level on the VIX, and that's generally going to be when the markets are moving up. Um, our, our, our clue for whether that, you know, the markets are going to stall or retrace or reverse or completely rotate up lower off major resistance and see more of a short to medium term downturn in the markets. That's going to start with the VIX spiking and closing above 20 when we're below 20. So <clears throat> today VIX closed right at 19. And remember last week, if you guys were on with us or you watched the, the recording from last week, we're keeping a clo close eye on this 18 to 19 zone. Because if we look at what the VIX has done, and in other words, what the major indices like the S&P and the NASDAQ have done when VIX has been down at these levels, we've gotten pretty significant market downturns in VIX spikes. Okay, so the, the main tool we use here is Trade trend buy, or if you're on our zillion platform, a buy signal um, below the 20 level. And in particularly, you know, in this case, like uh, if we're getting buy signals when VIX is dipped into that 18 to 19 zone, um, then be extra cautious, especially if S&P and NASDAQ are approaching uh, a resistance area where they have a higher likelihood of moving lower. And if we see that happen at the same time, the VIX spikes above 20, um, that's where we, we expect a, a much higher probability of a rotation lower in the, in the major indices. And of course, the S&P, for instance, is like kind of a, it's the mother product, right? It's like, it's the one we really use as a barometer because something like 75% of all stocks um, have some degree of correlation or track the S&P. So if the S&P moves down, it's going to affect about three quarters of the market, right? So a pretty relatively smaller percentage of, uh, you know, equity products are going to move counter to the S&P. So that get, alone gives us a good edge, you know. Um, and if you really want to track the S&P even more on a, a on a more correlated basis, you can trade an S&P product, you know, like 
a stock that's in the S&P 500 index or the S&P 100 index even. Um, all right. So yeah, so VIX is, is remaining low. And as long as it stays below 20 and the markets move up and, and hold support and don't rotate lower off resistance, then we expect the markets to keep going up with you know minor curves in the road on the way. Uh, okay. So that's our those are our key levels and what we're watching on the VIX, um, S&P, the monthly uh, 36 period moving average, um, and so on. So uh, pause there, see if there are any questions on, on that, and then we'll get into our strategy. No, there's no questions on that. I got a random question about something Zillion does on the chart, but it may be a Daniel question. I mean, you can give it, give it a go. Let me know, and I, yeah. I can so answer like it. If, we can if, refer. If, yeah, if you go back to the VIX, just kind of like open up in a larger screen. Okay, one second here. Could be any chart. But if you like randomly click on like any candle, let's say it doesn't have a, it gives those little blue dots. Yeah. You know mm -hmm. what those are? Because they don't um, really correlate to anything. No. Yeah. So I'm, I'm aware of them. Um, and I think it, it, if I, it, I could be wrong, but I think it's a trading view thing since we use trading view charts um, in our Zillion platform. Um, but no, I'm not sure. Yeah. It doesn't give um, any sort of readings or. Yeah. I mean, like if you hover over them, they don't. They don't do anything. Um, if you right click them, they don't do anything. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, for some reason, they do appear on the same candles no matter where you click. Okay. So they. Yeah. It must be some sort of trading view. Yeah. There's, there's a meaning to them. I'm just not sure uh, what it is, but it's not, it's not anything that's, I, I do know it's not anything that's like relevant to our algorithms and zillion. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's a trading view chart thing that I'm not sure what, what it means, but yeah, Daniel could, let's forward that question to Daniel and he could answer that. Yeah. Brennan's asking when the buy sell ratio is at extremes in the market sentiment, does that indicate a reversal is close? Um, yeah. So good question. So looking at the buy sell ratio here, um, it's, it, it's very extreme right now. Um, 97%, right? So, um, on the one hand that's bullish, but I don't just look at the percentage um, because I, I go into Zillion on a daily basis. And what I'm really looking for is the, the trajectory of the dial. So like when we're like in the, in the mid range and I see, you know, VIX move, moving down and S and P and NASDAQ moving up and I see our buy sells start to see a trajectory towards the buy range this is where I really want to get in when it's moving from the neutral to the buy uh, zone in the gauge. Um, when it's spiked so heavily, um, it's just because it, it's a cumulative uh, variable, right? So as more buy signals are coming in, um, they're overtaking the sell signals, the market's moving up. Um, I, I don't think, in fact, I've actually seen it this extreme at 97%. Um, but when it does get that high, it can't go much higher, right? It can only go 3% higher. And that's probably unlikely. It doesn't mean I wouldn't use it as a timing uh, tool. It doesn't mean like, all of a sudden, the market's just going to crash or anything like that. It just means that we really probably ex and a lot of these are probably open buy signals that have already run. So can take that into consideration as well. These aren't just pending buy signals. These are also triggered buy signals. So this just means that it's a good sign if you had um, gotten into buy signals when the gauge was moving up, because probably most of these are already buy signals that that have triggered days or even weeks ago and have been moving up um, in the forecasted direction. So that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, at the same time, they can only go so far, right? So we may see this gauge come down not you know doesn't mean it's going to come back down into the yellow or even the red it just means that you know we can only have so many buy uh signals both pending and open before that starts to drop back down because what happens with our algorithms of course is like if you look at you know um well i've got let's just pull up a stock here <clears throat> um take off X and futures. 
parentheses. So like if we look, um, you know, let's just look at like autoscope. Uh, so like this signal on autoscope from back in the start of the year in January, right? That this stock ran uh, way up, you know, uh, from buy signal entry, probably around 360 and change. Um, and it ran for a few weeks, but then around, you know, a bit above $4 a share, it's, you know, at that point had, you know, made like what, I don't know, 15 to 20% move. Um, the trailing stop algorithm uh, took this signal out around 412. Um, and so that's going to bring this gauge down as trailing stops are taken out. Um, then it will no longer be an open buy signal. But in this case, and in many other cases, the stock still ran up from there. So that's kind of what I was trying to emphasize is that this this gauge could come down and it doesn't mean the market run up is over. It just means that, you know, there might have been a breather, you know, there, a bit of a, a stall in the price movement or a retracement or whatnot. And as these are taken out, you're going to see this come down. Um, so key takeaway is I don't I'm not looking so much at the trajectory of the gauge within each um, section. It's when I see it move from one section to the other. So like when I see it move from neutral to bullish into the from the yellow into the green or from the red into the yellow or back from the green into the yellow, then I'm, you know, that's going to be my indicator that market market conditions might be changing overall. So uh, that's a good question. All right. Um... He says QQQ shows a Bollinger Band flare. What does a flare mean? Never heard of that. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming maybe like a, a widening of the outer bands. So it, right. what you mean, Roger? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's throw it up here real quick. Yeah, so when when price is so our outer bands are standard deviation bands. So when they're when price is following either the one of the outer bands, either the upper or the lower band, and both bands are diverging, um, that that tells us that the trend direction is strong. Um, in this case, you know, on the queues, price is continuing to follow roughly uh, the the two standard deviation. Uh, move away from the center band, which is our average. So what I look for with these is um, um, these are good potential entries when used in conjunction with support and resistance. And I look at the slope of the center band, which in this case is up. Price is, of course, trailing the upper band. Outer bands are diverging. So we call this a volatility expansion. So <clears throat> we're seeing um, price expand and actually make a move. Um, so it's just telling us that there's a strong uptrend at the moment. Um, when price is just moving, you know, as it was previously in a, what we call a volatility contraction mode um, until it broke out here around mid-March, um, you know, it's just kind of moving either in between the outer and lower bands or the middle and upper or middle and lower bands, which it was doing here for a while. So this is just consolidation. Um, and these can create great opportunities if you uh, know how to trade them. And we, we devised a strategy called the slingshot, which we've done past weekly sessions and presented. And that those recordings are uh, in our members area and on our YouTube channel that talk about how to trade these. But yeah, that's that's what's happening there. See, was asking real quick if you can look on your screen and see how it looked back in December, ending in early January. I think you've got it on there. On the queues? It's like you're still, yeah, you're still there. Yeah, um, last December was here. Yeah. This is January. So this is just a, this is a volatility expansion, a slingshot from December. 
to see how the outer bands are diverging price is trailing the lower band and lower middle band our average is sloping down okay and then we came right down into support around 260 <clears throat> on the cues that's a per that's a picture perfect slingshot that's what we teach on the slingshot right there okay that's all we got cool all right um thanks for that oh trend risk i saw that just briefly flash but yeah we can't go back on the gauges retrospectively and look at, at the readings on those so you'll just want to monitor those <clears throat> um if i'm a lot of times what i'll do like if i'm trying to track our market sentiment gauges i'll just take a screenshot and and date the file so i can go back and look uh but but these cannot be uh looked at in hindsight um all right so so last week we we um we left off talking about how to sell option premium to finance our options trades and uh we looked at some different ways to do that um in fact, why don't we use the VIX since we we talk a lot about the VIX um and a lot of you were following along with one of my recent VIX uh debit spreads which um I closed out a few weeks ago for a really nice profit um and I actually I used option premium that I sold to finance the purchase purchase of my VIX debit spread so I was out of out of pocket zero dollars for the trade and I actually in a, a, a bit more of an advanced approach to this uh this methodology I sold option premium in in the s ps in fact I sold it in the s p uh, futures options but um and that's one way to do it but we'll, we'll look at selling option option premium within the same product in this case the vix as well um so the nice thing and, and we'll, it'll kind of become clear as we look at the risk graph is it gives us a wider potential for po of positive outcomes um so the key like with any other strategy or approach you don't want to do it in a way that you exceed your risk tolerance so you always want to stay within your risk parameters if you're exceeding them like if you're if you you know transition to a new strategy and you find that you're all of a sudden exceeding your risk parameters take a really a hard second look at it you shouldn't shouldn't exceed your risk parameters even if you're adding another leg to an options trade or another strategy to an, you know you're combining strategies or whatever um always pay attention to your position size and so you're not exceeding your risk tolerance because for instance last week i think there were some questions like well if you sell the, if you sell the option premium you know aren't you aren't you then taking on additional risk uh well yeah on a on a numerical basis, you, you're taking on additional risk, but if you position size it accordingly and you look at it on a relative basis, um, it, you don't have to take on additional risk versus just selling or sorry, just buying the spread, right? It's just a matter of staying within your risk tolerance and using good position size and good money management. Um, so what it what it does do if you do it correctly it gives us a wider array of potential positive outcomes um so let's take a look at that like for instance on the vix because i like doing vix vol uh, you know volatility spreads on the vix or debit spreads basically um especially when the vix is low now i don't have one on right now because we don't have a uh, let me actually just get the chart of the vix back up here um we don't have uh bear with me here um a buy signal right the vix could continue to stay low for a while um so i don't want to jump the gun here and set up a spread prematurely i could i'm not saying that's wrong to do but i like to time it a little bit better um but vix is low now so inevitably the vix is going to spike up we know that and we just had a recent spike and this is where i made my money in my vix debit spread and again if you guys uh weren't in attendance that week when i was covering that trade uh you can go back and review that but i went through the whole mechanics of the trade and everything i didn't really go through so much financing the trade um by selling option premium so that's what i'm going to talk to you about and i'll show you one way to do it 
it's not the, the exact way I did it in this case, because like I said, I sold option premium and the S&P futures options. But th that's just another way to do it. But the principle is the same. You are selling premium to finance the cost of your other trade. <clears throat> that way, if you're wrong on your core trade, which would be the VIX debit spread that we'd be buying, it's a call debit spread, we buy it and we'll set one up here in just a second. If uh, we, we expect the VIX to spike up. So this is where I made my money. We got, you know, I set it up way back, you know, like 40 days prior. So we got the VIX spike in like early to mid-March. Um, you know, I sold it back in like January. All right, so VIX stayed low. We got a little bit of a spike here. I could have closed it out for a profit here, but it only got a spike like up into the 23 level. I, I knew, you know, historically that we're going to get a bigger VIX spike. And I still had plenty of time in my spread. Not to mention back here, it was a free, I don't, I don't remember exactly when. I'd have to go back and look at my statements, but some sometime way before I made the money on the, the call debit spread here, um, it was a free trade for me. I had already booked profits on the option premium I sold to cover the cost, what it cost me to buy the, the call debit spread. So even if I never got the VIX spike by the time my call debit spread expired, it would have been a break even. I wouldn't have lost anything. But not only did I make money, this is where it gets exciting. Not only did I make money by selling the premium, I made money on the call debit spread. So I made money on two separate trades, which is, an, as I said, there's a, a, a vast array of possible positive outcomes with this approach. So. Let's take a look at how we could set this up. And we'll just use the VIX. We won't get all fancy and use another product like the S&P to sell premium. Um, if we just look at an options chain of the VIX, let's see, get back over to our options chain, right? Um, and we talked last week about some of the parameters of, you know, how does, you know, expiration selection and, and strike selection and things, but we'll go a little bit more into that. So I like to, um, I, I want to buy, you know, whatever trade I'm putting on that I'm going to eventually finance um, is going to be my shorter duration trade. And that'll become clear, but I like to go, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, uh, 40 to, I don't know, 40, 70 days out, let's say, um, if I'm going to, if I'm going to buy a VIX call debit spread when the VIX is low, all right? And then for strike selection, so that I just selected the May 17th. And this is totally a, a, a demonstration. Please do not put this trade on because I'm not doing all my research on it. I'm just demonstrating the strategy. I haven't done the full, you know, support and resistance, you know, trade trend buy signals. I, there's more work to be done here, but I'm just showing you that how I structure it. So. Um, I didn't like to go out to like a 25 to 30 delta, maybe up to 35 delta. Um, and I can see here at the May 17th expiration, that's 42 days from now. Uh, the 27 strike has a 31 delta. Okay. Um, now, what else am I going to look at? Well, going back over to the chart. I know that VIX, when it spikes from, from below 20, it's not uncommon for it to spike up in like the 26 to 27 area, right? We just uh, zoom out of this a bit. Right. And it can often go way above. But look how many VIX spikes. You know, we're going back to a couple years, a few years almost. Look at how many VIX, VIX spikes. A lot of these are above 30. So if I give myself plenty of time, the, the odds of one of these is pretty good. Um, so if I look at a 27 strike, which is the strike I would buy, um, and then the one I would sell, so I'm actually, it's a spread, so I'm partly financing the, the 27 strike I'm buying with by selling a, a further out of the money strike, right? So it's a debit spread. I'm going to pay a debit for it. I could go like five points wide on this and buy a 27 and sell a 32, all right? 
Um, so let's go over to um, the, oh, I don't even know what I just did there. Um, let's add it, let's actually do a simulated trade here. So like, if I wanted to buy a VIX call debit spread, okay, so May 17th expiration, and I'm going to buy a vertical spread by buying the 27 strikes and selling the 32. So it's a five point uh, wide strike, five point wide spread, call spread. Currently, this would cost me 49 bucks a contract. So it, we'll, for our demonstration, we'll use 10 contracts. So if I were to trade the spread based on today's closing price, it would cost me 490 bucks to buy this spread. All right, so that's my first step. So I need to know like what is whatever trade I'm putting on, whether it's a spread or just buying a call or a put or whatever trade I'm trading, how much is it gonna cost me? Okay, if I'm not doing it for a credit, if I'm doing it for a debit, as in this case, because it's a call debit spread, and we make money on this spread if the VIX spikes, how much is it going to cost me? Well, it's going to cost me 490 bucks for 10 contracts in my spread. If I just did one contract, it's going to cost me 49 bucks. So yes, you can do this with a very small account. You can do this with a very large account. You just change your contract size. But at the very minimum, you could do this trade for 49 bucks um, on one contract. And the, the, not including, you know, any commissions or bro broker commissions or fees, but you can do these very cheap. All right. So if we do 10, 490 bucks, then, so now I know the cost of my trade. So my next step is if I don't want to debit myself 490 bucks and I want to finance this by selling premium, I go out to a later expiration. Now, this is kind of counterintuitive. If you guys trade options, you're probably thinking, well, why don't you go to a the near term expiration because you're going to get more theta decay and the premium, yada, yada. Um, because number one, especially on the VIX, you're not going to be able to collect enough premium to, for it to be viable. Number two, and this is most important, we're not going to hold the premium selling trade till expiration. So we're, we're going out to get the premium, but we're not necessarily going to hold it till expiration. Okay. We're going to try to capture that premium much earlier in the cycle. Now, VIX is low, so could it go lower? Yes, it could go lower, but it's at very strong level or zone of support between 18 and 19. So the, the higher likelihood is it's gonna spike. So that helps me in my strike selection. So I might go out um, somewhere between, let's see, we could go out to the, I don't like to go out, too much more than 100 days in expiration to sell the premium, but July 19th is 105 days from now, okay? Um, and what I can do is I can sell premium at an 18 strike. So that's the base in my support zone, 18. And I can get at the midpoint around $420 for 10 contracts. Almost covers my $490. I could just accept that and say, well, I'm you know, drastically reducing the cost of buying the spread by selling an equal number of contracts at the 18th strike and the July 19th expiration. Um, we could bump these contracts up to, to 12. So we'd sell 12 and that would put us um, pretty close to even money. You know, we're selling about the amount of premium we need to buy this spread. Um, I don't like to bump this up too much above the number of contracts in my spread that I'm financing. Um, that would be one option. We could do that. Uh, generally, rule of thumb, 20%. So we're staying within that, adding two contracts here. Um, so let's, let's take a look at this. So if we sold 12 contracts at 40, this is actually technically be like 42 at the midpoint, but we'll just use 40. That would bring us in 480 bucks. And it would cost us 490 bucks to buy this spread. Okay. So let's take a look at the risk profile. So we know, like, again, going back to the chart, VIX very frequently spikes up into where we've set up our spread 27, 
on the long call, 32 on the short, all right? <clears throat> now, if we look at this entire trade, the options that we sold the finance, which is the 18 strike put, July 19th expiration, this, the debit spread, the call debit spread that we're buying, which will make money if the VIX shoots up. Now, remember, both of these, but all of these these legs, or you know, the, this debit spread and this short 18 put are all going to make money if the VIX goes up, or the 18 strike put will make money as long as the VIX doesn't go down much more, right? So um, even if we got like a, uh, let's see, even if we got like a 20, so remember, this isn't, okay, really important point here. Just because we're financing this call debit spread by selling put premium does not mean there's not risk in this trade. So don't think, oh, it's this isn't really cost this thing's costing me 10 bucks, so I can only lose 10 bucks. Not the case. Okay, there's still risk in the trade. Right. Um, and we'll take a look at what that is. But what it is telling us is that we're not really paying anything out of pocket for this. So when you look at our potential percentage returns, we're making money off of basically nothing coming, you know, no outlay of cash. I mean, that's pretty cool because then you're looking at outrageous percentage, you know, ROIs. Now, what I'd like to do is just forget we sold any premium to finance this call debit spread. And we'll look at these individually. If I can make two to three times what I would have otherwise paid for this if I hadn't sold premium, which is 490 bucks, that's a good out. So what would it take me like across this entire spread? And we can you can change, you know, these risk profile dates, but even if we got a VIX 27 spike. So we're looking at the purple here because that's actually today's date. It wouldn't again, we can change that down here. Um but let's say we got it like next week, go out to the 11th. Okay, if we get a VIX 27 spike, our overall profit on this entire position would be uh, around 1,350 bucks. That's just if it goes to 27. So that's at the very, that's at our long strike, right? The one that we're buying. If it goes up to 30 or even 32 where we placed our short strike, Okay, our, um, so we're just looking at next week, like if that we were to get a big VIX spike, we've got a $2,200 profit at, at our short strike. Okay, that's across this entire position. If that happens, we close everything out, even the short options, even if they didn't decay down to zero. So remember I said, we're not, we're not gonna hold these trades till expiration, not our intention. So even though we're going far out, we don't hold them that long. Um, most of the time, because we don't need to. Now, if we look at these individually, so let's get rid of this call spread that we're buying and just look at the short put, okay? And let's go to, let's put this back on today's date. Okay. So our break even on the VIX, if we just sold these 18 strike puts, is at... 1760. So if even if VIX moved, so today it's at 19, even if it moved all the way down to 1760, right, that's uh, right here, um, we would be at a break even. Okay, so we don't start losing money until below that. Now, the um, If we look at expiration, which is our blue line, right? As long as we're above 18 at expiration, we retain the entire credit. Again, that's, you see that down here in the blue, $480. That's what we collect for selling 12 contracts at 40 bucks a contract, 18 strikes. So um, as long as VIX is above 18, that's fine. But what it really, all it really takes is 18 or, or these 18 strike puts, or is for the VIX to stay above 18 or move and move up, 
right, between now and expiration to capture a high percentage of this premium. Now, if this could happen in two, two different orders, we could get a VIX or we could get the VIX not moving a whole lot and we could see these decay, in which case we'd want to close, look at closing these out before the spread. That's actually what happened to me, except I didn't sell VIX puts, I sold S&P puts. But the S&P puts decayed because the S&P moved up and the VIX stayed low for a while after I set this trade up. So I booked the profits on my S&P uh, futures options puts and I had made enough to finance at that point the spread, but I left the spread open. The other order is, and this will be less seldom, we get a VIX spike, but it's just, it's so quick and we don't hit our profit target, our overall profit target. Um, and we close the spread out and leave these short puts open. That's not going to happen often. And I don't suggest that, you know, especially as you're starting out with this approach, doing it that way. Generally, when you close your whatever trade you're financing, close the short puts the or, or whatever premium you sold to finance your trade at the same time. Okay. So that's, that's kind of a good practice uh, approach. So, um, all right. So then, so we know like if we get one of these VIX spikes and even if we get one up into like 30, Uh, right here. Oh, I didn't reselect my spread. Oh, actually, let me go back to this. I was going to show you, like, so it doesn't take much of a, you know, a, a spike. We could get a spike up into twenty-four, and even if that happens tomorrow, it's not really enough to make the money on our spread that we want. But that's where we could close this out first. So like if we get a spike up into 24, we've already, that that would be a $383 profit. That's the majority of the profit we're going to get off of this trade. So we leave a little risk in this, but that's where I'm talking about, you know, we're not going to hold these, the put, the put premium that we sold till that far out expiration. It doesn't take much of a move to book a lot of that premium, if not all of it or almost all of it, you'd have, to get all of it, you'd have to hold it to your expiration, almost all of it, and finance the trade that you're putting on. In this case, a call debit spread on the VIX. Okay, so you can see that it doesn't take much um, of, a, of a move. Like just a, VIX to, a spike to 24 in the VIX would book us almost this entire premium. Okay, and then if we add the spread back in, um, because we'll have both trades on at the same time, right, even a 30 VIX spike, which we've seen many, many times over the past couple of years, um, would net us, uh, again, let's just go out. Yeah, it could happen tomorrow, but let's be realistic. You know, maybe it happens two weeks from now. I'm just all hypothetical here. You know, our a VIX spike to 30 would put us at about a $2,000 profit. Okay, that's four times um, a 400% return on if we just bought this spread, right? If we can get two to 300%, that's good. If we get 400%, I'm out. And I think I made like somewhere around 400% on my VIX uh, call debit spread that I put on previously. Um, then you're out, you know, and we're good. And it worked, It works in real life, right? Like I, like I said, if you follow the trade that I put on here, uh, we got a VIX spike just briefly, like over two days came up and hit 30. I think it was on right around here. I closed this out, my spread out. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the structure of that. Now, we can use these in different ways across different assets. Um, so probably the best way to start out is, you know, stick with stick within a security. Um, and there's different ways to, you know, get creative with this. It's better not to try to get too fancy or creative with it until you really understand it, practice it, paper trade it always, um, see how it works, that plays out and those types of things. Um, but that's an example of you know how we sell premium to finance the purchase of other trades um, just using the VIX. Um, do I do this with stocks? Yes. So one way I might 
use a, a kind of a similar methodology with a stock is let's say I buy shares of, uh, you know, Apple and I buy all done all my homework. I think the stock's going to go up, but I'm also well aware that you can do all your homework and sometimes the market throws you a curveball and the stock goes down. Um, so what I will sometimes do that in those, you know, when I, when I buy shares of a stock is I won't go into my full allotment all at once and I'll sell a lower strike premium. So like if I was looking, let me get back to Apple, you know, if I was going to buy shares of Apple at 165, but I'm like, uh, it's kind of like moving up, but into resistance and I'm worried it might, you know, retrace over the next couple months or something. And if it does do that, maybe I want to sell um, a lower strike premium. So let's say I buy 100 shares at current price levels. But what if it goes down like to 140? Well, that's a big percentage drop from 165 down to 140. Probably not likely. In fact, I can look at the probability. It is... Um, uh, probability in the money, only 10%. There's only a 10% chance of that happening. But if it did happen, I can sell a contract down here at 140 to help finance the price of what it cost me to buy the one, you know, buy the 100 shares at 165. So you do it on a one-to-one -one basis. For every 100 shares you buy, you sell one out of the money put. And then if if that out of the money put expires and other worthless, in other words, you keep all the premium, the stock remains above that out of the money strike price, you can do it all over again. Right. And eventually that money adds up and will finance the cost of what you bought the shares for. Now it, it it's a bit more of a kind of a complex. Uh, scenario because every situation is a bit different. So I'm just kind of running through this very quickly with you, but that's one way to finance um, the shares. It also, if, if the stock did go down and you were assigned shares at that lower strike, we, we, we would take assignment where we would do this trade with the intention and of, of the possibility of assignment because then it lowers our cost basis, right? If we, um, you know, let's say we sold the 145s, 20 bucks below current price levels. If we got a sign on those, it would be like we bought our 200 shares that we now own at 155 instead of 165. So not only did we uh, lower our cost basis, right? We financed some of that by selling premium. Then we can, as long as we haven't exceeded our risk tolerance, the number of shares we're capable or willing to buy, we could do it again at a lower price. And so you can see how this kind of all builds up. Um, we can go, you know, go out to different expirations. Um, again, it's better to get more creative with things once you understand it and, and practice it. But uh, that's kind of the the process. Um, um, and then also, <clears throat> we can do that on the call side, right? So once we're accumulating shares by selling premium, um, we can also sell calls, you know, uh, to to uh, offset drawdowns in the stock, etc. Um, so yeah, it doesn't just have to be, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to like just do it in the, within the options market. You could do it across options and equities or ETFs, um, or even the futures markets. If you have options on futures trading capabilities. Um, all right. So went through a lot of stuff there, but, um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and I wanted to kind of elaborate on what we, we talked about last week and show you guys risk graphs and, set up kind of a hypothetical example trade on the VIX to show you how it works and what it looks like. Um, but we'll pause there, see if there are any questions, and then maybe take a few tickers for a ticker roundtable. There's a couple of questions. Most of the questions are kind of centered around um, cost and margin requirements. With this, a lot of folks are saying uh, due to their account sizes or it may cost them $25,000 to put on the same trade or $7,000 in buying power. Can you kind of touch on that? Even though it may not cost people money, but, um, yeah, so yeah. It, it's it's always a common question. It's difficult to answer because every, everyone has different account types. Um, there's portfolio margin, there's standard margin accounts. Um, they're all going to hold different amounts of margin. Um, my my 
kind of go-to answer for that that kind of stuff is adjust your position size. If if you're using too much leverage or you're having to use margin outside of the value of your, of your account, you're trading too many contracts. So that's really the best way because every, again, everyone's personal situation is different. How much capital they have, um, you know, what their how their account set up under what margin uh, regs they're set up under, all that stuff. So. Um, I can't answer that for everybody. What I can tell you is you can you can adjust your position sizing to put these trades on. If you have a smaller account, you can do these trades. Um, one one workaround on that is um, if you can get op uh, options on futures approval from your broker to trade options on futures, you can sell those. They actually hold uh, significantly less margin than uh, equity futures do. Or equity options, sorry. Um, so that's one workaround. Um, but the the standard one is you know lower your number of contracts, um, and uh, and then trade management's critical, right? We never want to get in a situation where we're losing the maximum potential loss on a trade. We need to manage the trade, um, uh, uh, you know, appropriately. Um, one one of those things being we're not holding this till expiration. That's when you're going to see a max loss if things go bad. Is at expiration, so we want to get get out of these trades. Um, you know, ideally, you know, it, it it at the very least three weeks before expiration. You're you you do not want to be holding these types of trades uh, within three weeks of expiration, because um, then you get into what's called gamma risk, uh, and and that's where margin uh, can really bite you there if you're if you're using margin to, to put these trades on. Um, but yeah, those would be the ways uh, you could try options on futures, um, lower margin requirements, uh, talk to your broker about what type of margin setup you have, what kind of margin account, um, and then, of course, uh, look at your position sizing. Um, it's okay to start out with one contract. Um, you know, if you have a smaller account, it's going to be a high, still going to be a high percentage. Remember, everyone's percentage, all, all, all else being equal, is going to be the same, whether you have a $2,000 account or a million dollar account. If you trade the same strategy and you're just using different position sizes, your percentage gains on your account are going to be, would be the same, all else being equal. So you, you never want to think, you know, if you have a $2,000 account, you're going to make the same amount of money that somebody with a million dollar account does. That's, that's how you're going to blow up your account. If you have that mentality, it's not going to happen. But percentages, you can, doesn't matter what your account size is, percentages, you can Make the same percentage gain on your account. If you have a two thousand dollar account or a million account dollar account, you can't make the same amount of money. So just adjust your position sizing. Um, another thing too to add to that is, if it's an issue of selling a naked premium, you can sell spread premium to do this as well. Um, so that would be another workaround there. So rather than selling just a short put, you could sell a a, a put credit spread, or you could sell a call call credit spread. Um, that'll greatly reduce your margin requirements. It makes it a little bit more difficult to adjust the trade if, if it comes to that, but um, that would be a way to reduce margin as well. But I prefer to reduce my contract size than set, uh, financing with a, a, a spread versus a single leg option. Beautiful. Covered pretty much. Um... Brendan just has a quick question about the platform. Do we have any plans to make it work? Let's see on intraday, like a four hour chart. Uh, we do as for a zillion, do you mean? Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. We're actually uh, in the, we're in negotiations and uh, even in the programming uh, for a bunch of the major brokers. So we're going to be integrating uh, more brokers like interactive brokers, TD Ameritrade, which I guess is technically Schwab, uh, thinkorswim, um, uh, trade station, um, so if you use the broker integration, uh, it'll be all intraday real-time data. And not only that, you can access, you'll be able to access your personal account within the dashboard. Uh, it'll show all your open positions, your profit P&Ls, um, even allows you to allow you to place trades within the dashboard. So you don't have to do it separately in your account. Uh, and then we're also uh, kind of doing some shopping right now to look for uh non-broker intraday data. So like if you don't integrate your broker or your broker's not offered on our platform um 
uh, to provide that as well. So it's all in the works yet. We're working feverishly to get that done. Uh, Stan has asked, what kind of adjustments do you do to the trade? Um, yeah, that's something, you know, we've covered adjustments for these strategies for like debit spreads, credit spreads, uh, short puts and other weeks. So kind of the idea of our weekly sessions, I know it's a lot of like information that might not be, you know, sequential necessarily, but um, the idea is like to take what we've done in other weeks and you can kind of combine it. So we've covered trade adjustments in other sessions. And so you could review those. Um, but in, in kind of the case of these types of trades, you could obviously adjust the debit spread, um, which I generally do not do because I'm financing that with, uh, you know, by selling option premium. So if I'm going to make an adjustment, it's most likely going to be to the, uh, the premium I'm selling. Um, so one of those would be rolling, right? You can roll out your puts like if you sell puts to finance a spread you can roll those out um and i that would be my kind of go-to on the vix because um i know there's a high probability of vix spikes the vix not isn't going to stay low forever so i'm okay with rolling those out i just got to make sure i can do that for an equal or greater credit um which can sometimes be an issue on the vix because of uh forwardation backwardation um so you got to watch out for uh volatility skew basically but um th that would be kind of the way i would adjust and it's usually going to be an adjustment of the short premium where you're uh either rolling that or hedging it um and and last week we actually talked about selling premium on the same side of the the options chain so like if you're doing a call spread you could sell a call um or if you're doing a put spread you could sell a put um and and the difference in that and what we just kind of looked at today is is you're actually kind of hedging um uh your other spread which also reduces margin requirements um and makes it easier to to make adjustments so yeah rolling is kind of the standard adjustment that we do um if we still have you know the outlook that we did when we we initially entered the trade um is a way we can make adjustments to those um, but right. always keep in mind too, like we're setting these out very far in expiration. So we're giving these plenty of time to work out. Um, that also means there's time for things to, you know, not work out, but it, it gives us time to, to manage. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I never, I don't want to panic just because it doesn't work out right away or I get a little bit of an adverse move. Um, I've got a lot of time for these things to play out. So that's the idea. All righty. Well, shoot, we ran, you know, it's it's already an hour and 10. Um, I apologize again, we didn't do take a round table. Let's let's dedicate next week and we'll 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 revisit the strategy again next week because I think there's probably some more questions and people want to see more of it and how we can implement it on on individual tickers and that will take some time. So let's do that next week. Um we'll probably start up a new strategy again next Tuesday uh as well, but we'll we'll start out the session after we do our market overview next week. So we can take your, uh, we'll just start out with ticker roundtable for the strategy. Um, and and then we can kind of move on from there and see how long that takes. Because I want to make sure I give everybody enough time to share theirs. And I know we don't, we're, we're 10 minutes over tonight and I don't want to like cut people off and stuff and not give them the full time. So um, if that's fair to everybody, let's do that next week. And um, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to the, uh, answer those now though. That's all I got. No others. Okay. Well, if you guys do have questions, um, even if it's on a signal or anything that you might want to share in Ticker Roundtable, uh, please email us to us at support at altostrading.com. Um, and uh, keep an eye on those levels. Keep an eye on 4,100, 4,200, 4,100 support, 4,200 resistance on S&P. Those are going to be critical this week, um, especially tomorrow at the open. See where the S&P opens and closes relative to that 4,100 support that we're at uh, right now. Um, and then we'll revisit that, follow up with it next Tuesday. So we will see you guys next Tuesday, same time, same place. Um, thanks. Happy Easter. Yeah, thanks. Happy Easter to all of you as well. I hope you guys have a nice uh, three-day weekend celebration with your family. Remember, the markets are closed on Friday, uh, and we'll see you guys all next week. Take care.